on calculations. Icebox in particular, although not always. Um, as you see in number 53, you don't need an icebox when they give you the equilibrium conditions. But um, when they don't, you do. Yeah? Yeah, so we, we, is it time to have the talk? Okay, yeah. So guys, let, let me give you the historical perspective on significant digits in AP chemistry. Um, so uh, where do we start? So 19, two, the year 2000, which is when I started teaching AP. Well, that's a long time ago. Um, significant digits were huge. Either you did them right or you didn't get credit. Um, I know. And so then what they did is, is like four or five years into my stint teaching this, they loosened up a little bit. And the rule became you have to be within one significant digit on either side of the correct answer. So let me explain what that means. Um, so for example, if you had an... Well, let's just use a familiar number. So if the answer for some weird reason was Avogadro's number, that's three significant digits. So what that meant is that your answer had to range somewhere between one significant digit and, and uh, so sorry, that's three. So, oh, sorry, two and four. So you had to be within one significant digit on either side of the number of significant digits required. So if it was three, um, oh, I'm really struggling. Sorry, y'all. So if it was three, you need one, two, th you needed between two and four. Um, and that was great, except for um, AP chemistry teachers finally figured out how to game the system. And what we did is we just told our students to always put three significant digits. Because the problem, I mean, think about all the problems that you've solved in this class. Never do you see one significant digit. Never do you see five significant digits. So three always put you in the sweet spot for significant digits. Um, and because all of the more intuitive in AP teachers were telling their students to game the system by putting three, um, back in 2014, they got rid of significant digits altogether. <laughs> And all hell broke loose. Um, all of a sudden, you had all these kids that were writing like everything in their calculator. And it had to be right. And like seriously, there were AP graders, especially the university professors that grade the test, that were just like dying inside because there were all these kids that were just, I mean, everything there. And so a couple of years ago, they brought it back. And we're back to this rule. So the answer is always put three. Does she say that? Really? Well, now you know why. Um, but I don't know if it's a carryover from that. But so the answer is on the AP test, you always need to be within one significant digit on either side of the correct number of digits. Um, but uh, we're just going to put three when we start doing the test. So guys, anything about the homework? Did I just cuss a second ago? Is hell even a cuss word? It's a place. Never mind. <laughs> it's like where I grew up in Wyoming. Yeah. It's a place in Wyoming. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, the converting from KC to KP. I, I've done all sorts of damage for you, haven't I? Yeah, uh, no. So guys, I, I, I totally dropped the ball. I know we mentioned it in passing, but I know that you guys are so task-oriented that this may have created problems. There is an equation that allows you to convert from KC to KP. It used to be on our equation sheet. We used to do those conversions, um, and I just totally dropped the ball and forgot to remove those questions from the homework assignment. My bad. Don't worry about it. The, the only thing you need to know is they are different. Yeah. That's it. Yeah? Uh, 
That's an in, is that in this assignment? Um, so here, let, Max, let's just talk about it. So when you're converting from KC to KP, KP is pressure, and now we're thinking about gases. And what you're going to find is that when, well, you'll, there's a connection here. Let's play with this for a minute. So when we talk about gases, we have things that, that describe gases like R values and temperatures. Um, and so we bring that into the calculation when we convert from KC to KP. But the other thing that we bring into the conversation is change in number of moles. Um, and so you asked the question, apparently there's a question in the homework that says, if the change in number of moles is zero, then KC and KP are the same, right? And so your question is, do we need to know that? And the answer is no, but um, what you're going to see is that in about 10 minutes, we're going to dig into Le Chatelier's principle. And when we do, we're going to talk about how gas phase equilibria move left and right depending upon the change in number of moles. So in that sense, you do need to understand the bigger principle because it actually determines the direction that equilibria shift when you mess around with moles. Um, so in that sense, you do need to know it, but relative to that idea that KC and KP are the same, don't worry about that. What else, y'all? Yes. Yeah. Is, so when you say hypothetically, is there not an example of this? Okay. Yeah, let's talk about it. So for example, if you've got... I'm totally spitballing this, right? But if you've got 2A plus 3B in equilibrium with a C and a D, I don't even know if this works, but is that what you're talking about? So, yes? Will that get us where you want to go? Okay, so when we write the ice box, if I understand what you're saying, um, we've got some number here, we've got some number here, and we say that again. No, because we, we always know the coefficients. No, like the number. So if you know like the number for the 2A, but you don't know the number for the 3B, like how would you know how to solve the number for the Yeah, okay, so let me finish with this because I think this is gonna get us where we want to go. So fundamentally, whether it's the way I'm approaching it or the way you're approaching it, what we're talking about is how do we identify the changes? Right? And so the idea is this. We just identif we identify, we can, we can use the coefficients. So in this case, this would be plus x. Oh, thank you. Why am, oh, no, it's just that slow. So we've got plus x and we've got plus x. So the idea then is if those are our x's, this would go down by 2x and this would go down by 3x. Does that get you where you want to go? Is that okay? So those coefficients become the changes. Yep. What else, y'all? We done? Please. Uh, this is kind of a general question. Like, we look at 36B? Yeah. 30, oh, drawing dots. 36, that guy? Yeah. So basically, um, I said because we have a large AP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Do we yeah. I don't know. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, your question is: is does the word "large" satisfy the? Yeah. I would be really surprised if an AP grader would would not say that that's an acceptable answer. Um, I mean, large, large assumes bigger than, doesn't it assume bigger than one? I mean, if something's big, it's bigger than, I mean, in my little world, I, I think, you, so mathematically, technically, if you wanted to really justify the answer, it's because it's bigger than one. Um, but I don't think they would, I don't think they would, I think they'd be okay with it. Um, it's a gamble, but I think it's a gamble you'd probably win, so. What else, y'all? Are we good?
We're good? Okay. So, guys, today is going to be uh, short. Um, today is the last day of this unit. Um, we will be taking the test over this unit on Monday. Um, in addition to that, your previous tests are almost done graded, if that's really a sentence. I'm almost done grading them. I'll have those to hand back to you Monday as well. Um, remember, those are the ones that were one and done, but you got to, you, you already saw the things you did wrong, right? Yeah, that's the good sentence too. Um, so I'll have those back to you on Monday. We're going to take the test on Monday. We will include this test on third quarter's grade. I will fast like a bunny, get them graded and back to you. And then we will get these on second quarter, on third quarter's grade. And then guys, after that, we've got functionally one and a half more units to go. We've got acids, bases, and equilibrium. Um, then after that, we've got the electrochem unit, which is frankly three days including the test. It's quick. Um, and so, guys, we are round in the corner. And as I told you, the AP test is tomorrow. <laughs> Go ahead. So, Skyward would tell you that the end of the quarter is the 12th. So for the school district, the district, it's the 12th. Um, but yeah, and then guys, I, it doesn't apply to us, but also if you can picture a calendar, the 12th is a Friday, so so is the 5th. Um, do you guys know the 5th is a minimal day? Does, does anybody, my question, why? Um, do you? Oh, shoot, that's it. We did this before, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. So, guys, um, so Friday of, is that? That is next Friday. Um, so, nine, eight days from now is a minimal day for your B day classes. All right. So, guys, you need uh, something to write with, something to write on. And, Braden, were you good on this homework? Yeah. Matthew? Yeah. Uh, Donnie, you good? Yeah. Sophia? Yeah. Annika? No. no. And, Ethan? No. Ishmael? Josh, yes. Diana, yes. Chandler, yep. Isaac, you good? Gone. Uh, Ellie, yes. Landon, yes. Nathan, you good? Yes. Emma, yes. Max, yes. Leslie, Gage, you good? No. Ronnie, gone. Uh, Kaylee, Spencer, Daniel, you good? And Meredith. Yeah, just one second. Let's get everybody together. <laughs> Do we need the questions? Okay. Okay, so guys, before we bridge forward into the last day of material, Donnie has one more thing he'd like to explore. Go ahead. Yeah, basically, on the last problem, that was the one we needed to do the quadratic formula. Oh, yeah, hold on. Let's, let's look at it. So guys, Donnie's turning our attention to this. Typically, at this point in, in this process, at least some student in the class just shares their admiration and awe at the fact that I actually type up all these things. You guys never even went there. <laughs> so really last night when you were doing your homework, you never got to the point where you said, this is how much Mr. Knappenberger loves us. All right, that's fair. Go ahead. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah, good. So let's, now that you, so forgive me, but we did talk about this last time, but now that you've had the experience, let's do it. So guys, this is a universal principle. How much work do you need to show on the AP test? And the answer is this. If there is an equation that you're drawing on, you always have to show it. Pivnert, write it down. Now guys, with that said, 
when you write your KCs, KAs, KBs, KWs, KSPs, any Ks, you do not have to write the general form that says X to the A, Y to the B, whatever that is. You don't have to do that. But what you do have to do is this. So bottom line, you need to set up your icebox. You need to do the background calculations that bring you to, in this case, the molarities. So this has got to be there. The icebox has got to be there. And then this, oh, poop. Don't touch the board. Um, then in addition to that, this has got to be there. You have to set it up. Products divided by reactants, that's got to be there. Then this has got to be there. You've got to plug in your values. At that point, you can write down the answer. You don't have to show anything else. Um, I mean, in this case, you needed to get this into standard form before you can solve it. You don't even need to show that. Um, you just need to show the setup so that, you're, so that the grader can look and go, what numbers are they basing this calculation on? And then at that point, you don't even need to give the nonsensical result. You just need to give the answer. You, oh, if you did that, you've shown that and more. Yeah, absolutely. So, but do you understand what I'm saying is everything from here above, you can let your calculator do. Um, with that said, there's one other thing you need to show. Guys, please, do, a lot of people make this mistake on the test and the AP test. They get to this point and they get so excited that this actually worked and they were able to solve the quadratic formula and they forget to plug this number back in up here. Guys, please do not forget to do that. That's why I made it in blue so it stood out. Make sure that you're then doing this, plugging in the X and solving for these molarities. Okay, yeah. Let me show you. Yeah, let me, that's a great question. Yeah, no, that's, so let's talk. So guys, what does the AP test actually look like? And the answer is this. This is the AP test. Well, not last year's, because last year's was online. So this is the 2018 test. Doesn't matter, they're all the same. So first of all, about writing big, write big. Seriously, eight, so... No, different questions, same structure. So realize that AP graders, they grade these things in gymnasiums at universities. And these poor people are huddled over tables literally for eight hours a day reading student work. It's a fate worse than talk. So there's three places where hell exists. <laughs> Wyoming and wherever they're grading AP tests. Um, but to answer your question right big, and this is how much space you have. You have unlimited, and so understand that like for example, um, this is like, quest so question number one on the 18 test is two pages long. It's big. But then you have um, this and this, and well that's it. So you've got that much space to solve the problem. So you, you, I've never had anybody run out of space. So. You guys good? You ready to do this? Other things you want to talk about? Guys, I love that your attention is starting to turn towards the AP test. What's up with significant digits? Am I going to run out of space? Guys, these are the kind of things that you want to, you want to sort of start to keep that in front of you as you're working through some of this. So um, other things to talk about? Matthew, were you going to say something else? Sure. <laughs> I saw you go like this and... That's all right. Um, so if it's all that packing, are we getting put back and forth? Yeah, good, yeah, good question. Um, and the answer is, I don't always know. Um, yeah, so, so under, I've, I've, I've never taken an AP test. They didn't have AP in my high school. Um, but in addition to that, um, so... They, they, they change the way they administer the test. I don't know what's going to come in 2021, um, but in years past, understand, you get two copies of the test. One is that, which you eventually will get graded. That goes to the that goes to that place we've been talking about. And then the other one um, stays with the AP. So you actually have two full copies of the test, so you're not flipping back and forth. Um, 
I don't know what they're going to do this year. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say that you won't be. Yeah. Mm, so <laughs> again, we need to. I I, I don't know, but. Um, if, if this were any other year than this year, I would say you'll be in the library and you'll have all the space you need. Um, I hope that that's still the case. We do know that we will be offering the test in school. Um, we do know that we will be offering a paper version of it, which isn't surprising to us, right? Because we've been in school all year. But there are some schools that are going, really? We can give this in school in other states. Um, so we know that we'll offer it. So I think we'll be in the library. Um, some years we've been in the wrestling room, and that's been really weird and stinky. Um, but my suspicion is we'll be, we'll be in, in the library. Yeah. So frustrating. Wait, wait until you get to college and the desks that you have are in the theater seats and it's a little slab of wood that folds up and out and they're always right-handed. They're always right-handed. Does it really? For the ACT? Somebody must have brought a lawsuit. Yeah, someone has. Like, Give me a lefty table. Uh, yeah. I was never the kid people wanted to cheat off of. That's interesting. Oh, so, so the ACT when I was a student was a whole different deal. You took it once. You were done. You didn't study for it. You just went and took it. And I got a 28, so... And that was it. I was done. It got me. It got me a scholarship to the a full ride to the University of Wyoming, and off we went. So, go Pokes! Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh goodness. Okay, so guys, Lashotley is principal. Again, keeping with this. Um, Keeping with the work that we're doing to make up for the fact that you guys learned this stuff during the, the height of the COVID crazies. And literally, this, I think, was the last thing that you learned last year before we just called it quits and wrapped up the school year. Um, so you didn't learn this in person. You learned it online. Um, we were struggling at best to try to find ways to present this to you from a distance. So guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring you back to our water tube game. And I'd like to, um, to share with you Le Chatelier's principle um, conceptually. Um, so guys, let me give you Le Chatelier's principle in a three minute demonstration. And I think that this will anchor this for you. And then the rest of the day is gonna go really fast. Do you guys have, what's the numbers? I love that you guys know that. Um, 65 over here, right? Do you guys ever struggle with that like I do, that you have no problem remembering really stupid stuff like 65, 35, but the stuff you'd really like to remember, not a chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so 65, 35. So guys, by, by way of review, as we think about the concepts that we've learned about equilibrium. So we know that this thing is gonna settle down at a 65-35 ratio. But are you comfortable with the idea that it doesn't matter where we start? We could have started with all product, no reactant, all reactant, no product, some of each, doesn't matter, we're gonna end up here. Is that good? Okay. Now guys, um, let's talk. So we've now got this system that's at equilibrium and you understand that if I keep doing this, it's not gonna change, right? Okay, now we need to bring Le Chatelier's principle into this, into, this converse, into this demonstration. So guys, Le Chatelier's principle is all about stress and response. 
stress and response. So how do we stress a reaction? And the answer is we add stuff to it or we take stuff away. So guys, for example, this. If I kept doing this, this thing's not going to change, right? But what if I come along and do this? Now I've added some reactant. And this reaction is no longer at equilibrium. Are you comfortable with that? I just caused the reaction stress. So now, guys, as this reaction continues, what's going to happen? Well, guys, watch close. Just sort of eyeball the levels and then watch. So as I continue, what is happening to the amount of reactant? Is it going up or down? The amount of reactant is going down. Where's it going? It's becoming product. And guys, eventually what's going to happen? It's going to get back to equilibrium. Will it be 65-35? No, but the ratio, what, that's like 2 to 1, right? That ratio, the 65-35 ratio, will be restored, just not at 65-35, but we'll get back to equilibrium. Does that make sense? So guys, look at what we did. We added reactant. What did the reaction do? It got rid of it. Now guys, what if we take away reactant? So if we take reactant away, now watch what happens. So now the reaction, in trying to get back to equilibrium, what's it doing? Making reactant by turning product, and guys, forgive my mask, by trying to turn product into reactant, and the amount of reactant is going up. So now, guys, let's do this. Let's start with a bunch of reactant, and now let's take away product. Now watch what happens. Now as we do this, what's happening to the amount of product? It's going up. So guys, we did three different changes. We added reactant, we removed reactant, and then we removed product. And we looked at the way the system responds to those changes. Can you summarize what you saw in those three examples? What is the summary statement? What is the general principle here when we stress reactions. Go ahead, Chandler. So be careful with, e I love the way you're trying to organize this, but be careful with the equilibrium going up or down. It actually doesn't change. It'll always go back to 65-35. Given that idea, do you want to amend your answer? Yes. And so they will change, but let's see if we can come up with a more general observation. Were you going to jump in, Ethan? I thought I saw. Okay, so the ratio doesn't change. The ratio will always remain 65 35. Just a second, we're going to go ladies first. Go ahead, Steph. That's true. That's absolutely true. But at a micro scale level, how does it do that relative to what we added and removed? Donnie, did you want to jump in? It always proceeds, which is kind of like Q, right? Because maybe I'm not framing the question well. Let's do this. So imagine that this thing is back at something like equilibrium. And when I took away reactant, what did the reaction do? Made more. When I added reactant, what did the reaction do? Got rid of it. When I removed product, what did the reaction do? Made more. Do you see the summary there, guys? Reactions will all, equilibrium reactions, will always respond to stress by undoing the change that you make. It's kind of like a really stubborn kindergartner. You tell them to sit down, they stand up. You tell them to stand up, they sit down. 
they will defiantly do exactly the opposite of what you've done to them. So guys, if you take, again, let's go back to equilibrium. But guys, if we're at equilibrium, and if I add reactant, the reaction's going to get rid of it. If I remove reactant, the reaction's going to make more. Whatever you do to a reaction, the reaction is going to struggle to undo whatever it is that you've done. Do you understand the idea? Guys, the question is this. So this is 35-ish. Let's pretend that's 35. Let's pretend this 65. Guys, the question is why? Because obviously these reactions, right? And this is representative of a reaction. Because the reaction doesn't know. It doesn't know it's supposed to be stubborn. It doesn't know that it should try. What is it about the reaction that causes this to happen so that the reaction is undoing whatever you do? Go ahead. That's it. Which therefore changes what? Which therefore changes the rate. So guys, this is all about rate. Check this out. If I take reactant... Oh, that's not at equilibrium. Is it now? Let's say that's 65. Let's say that's 35. So guys, you got to look at this through the lens of rate because that's the way you're going to explain this on the AP test. So guys, it goes like this. Right now, we'll assume this is at equilibrium. Right now, what do you know about the forward and reverse rate? They're the same, right? But now guys, what happens if I add a bunch of reactant? Well guys, what's going to happen to the amount of reactant? Is it going to go up or down now that I've made the change? So as I continue now, look at what's happening to the amount of reactant. Is it going up or down? It's going down. Why? Because adding reactant increases the forward rate of reaction. We get this reactant turning into product until it comes back to equilibrium. Now guys, what happens if I take away reactant? Now what's the forward rate? Zero. So now the reverse rate is faster. That's floating. The reverse rate is faster, and now the amount of product is going down, and it's replacing the reactant that I took away. So guys, all of this stuff about these reactions responding to change by undoing the change is all a function, as you said, Matthew, of concentration and rate. If you add something, it increases the rate and that goes down. If you remove something, it slows the rate and it replaces it. Do you get the idea? So guys, again, when you describe this on the AP test, it's got to be about rates. They'll ask you, what effect will increasing the concentration of H2 have on the reaction? And what are the answer is, and then it says explain. And it's because it increases the forward rate of the reaction. It always comes down to rate. You guys okay on this? Guys, we've got like 10 minutes to summarize this in a couple different contexts and we're done. So guys, fundamentally, do you have questions about what we just did, which is Le Chatelier's principle? You okay? Do you remember any of this from last year? Maybe. Isn't that strange? So what you're telling me is that online instruction is actually not? Really? <laughs> All right, so guys, you ready? Le Chatelier's principle in a nutshell. One, two, three. Le Chatelier's principle simply says this. If, an equilibrium, if a system at equilibrium is stressed, it will shift in a direction that partially undoes the effects of the stress-causing change. dot, 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 moving back to equilibrium. While I'm at it, you turn that in with your test. <laughs> I graded it. You bet. So, guys, again, when you explain why Le Chatelier's principle is happening, how, what, what's going on. 
it's always got to be about concentrations and rates. But with that said, allow me to share with you the rule of thumb that will allow you to make these predictions, which you can then explain. And guys, the rule of thumb is this. Same side does the opposite. Opposite side does the same. Guys, this universal principle will get you through the thinking about the direction the equilibrium shifts. Then you just have to explain it using rate. So here's what we're going to do. Don't write any of this down after this, but here's the deal. Guys, we are now going to talk about this idea of Le Chatelier's principle in three contexts. First, we're going to talk about um, concentration changes, adding or removing products. Then, guys, we're going to get to, I think it was Max's question, or when we were grading homework about this idea of change in number of moles. Wasn't that? Yeah, okay. And we're going to talk about this relative to changing pressure. You'll see it's related. And then, guys, finally, we're going to talk about this relative to changing temperature. How does temperature, pressure, or concentration changes tie in to Le Chatelier's principle? Then briefly at the end, we'll talk about catalysts, and then we'll be all done. You guys ready to go? Concentration first. So consider the Haber process that is this. And, guys, you don't need to write this down. But here's the question. How will adding hydrogen to this reaction affect the equilibrium? So guys, let's talk about this. Here's how you discuss this. Will it shift the equilibrium to the right or to the left? How will, and, and I don't ask it rhetorically, I'd like you to come up with an answer in your brain. So when we add hydrogen to this, it's at equilibrium, when we add hydrogen to the equilibrium system, will that shift the equilibrium to the right or to the left? Because what's the answer? To the right. And here's how we know. This is the way to think about this generally. So the change that we're making is we're increasing hydrogen. And guys, if we increase hydrogen, remember our little, our little, it's not a mnemonic, but our little phrase, same side does the opposite, opposite side does the same. When we say same and opposite, we mean same and opposite side of the yield zero. So guys, if we're adding hydrogen, everything on the same side is going to go down. So the amount of hydrogen will go down. And then everything on the opposite side will go up. So the NH3 goes up, and as a result, it shifts the equilibrium to the right. Does that predictive thought process make sense? Here then is the question, why? Why does adding hydrogen make NH3 go up? Guys, what's it got to be about? More reactant? Keep going, Donnie. So what does that change? Of what? And we're going to call that the forward reaction. So guys, the reasoning goes like this. Adding additional hydrogen increases the rate of the forward reaction. As the forward reaction is going faster, this gets produced. But guys, as that is getting produced, this is getting consumed. And as a result, this goes down and this goes up and that shifts the equilibrium to the right. Does that make sense? Go ahead. The, the, well, the rate or the concentration? Because an element, a, a factor of a reaction doesn't have a rate. It has a concentration. I guess. So the concentration of N2 will go down. So in order to get rid, this is the, what's going on. In order to get rid of the excess hydrogen, the reaction bonds it together with nitrogen and turns it into NH3. Why does that happen? Collision model. If we've got more hydrogens, hydrogen will more likely run into nitrogens, turning it into NH3. So it increases the forward rate. Is that okay? Go ahead, Matt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No, because you always have the reverse reaction, right? So realize that what it's going to do is it's going to come back to equilibrium, right? So we will still have the same proportional ratio of products and reactants. And so this thing, I mean, again, like our silly number is 65 over 35. So pretend that's this. So this is our 65, and this is our 35. And as we add this, it's going to come back to the same equilibrium ratio, but there will be more of this in, in that equilibrium mixture. Okay. I was just thinking, like, if it's a It will, and it'll be at the same equilibrium. And I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm sort of letting you not like this answer for a minute because I'm about to show you the picture. Um, but the idea is that we will have more of this because this is getting created, right? And we'll have this, some of this will be consumed. Now, here's the question, and we haven't talked about this yet. What will happen to the final concentration of hydrogen? And the answer is, we've added hydrogen. So initially, there's more of it. But as this hydrogen bonds together with the nitrogen that was already there to turn into NH3, some of this is going to be consumed. So it'll go up, but then it'll drop. And eventually, then, the, 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 the product, if you will, the numerator products times, so the, the, not the sum, but these multiplied together will come back to this ratio. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This is actually the data. Let me grab my, my writing utensils and then zoom in a little bit. So it actually looks like this. So here we've got a constant amount of hydrogen and nitrogen and ammonia. So we know, do you, are you okay with that? We know we're at equilibrium because those are not changing. And guys, this is concentration and time. And then at some time, we squirt in a bunch of hydrogen. So now we've got additional hydrogen, we've got additional hydrogen, and so that increases the rate of the forward reaction. And as that happens, look what happens to the concentration of the ammonia. As predicted, the amount of ammonia goes up. And guys, as that happens, the amount of nitrogen goes down. But now let's look at what happens to hydrogen. So hydrogen spikes when we squirt in the hydrogen, but then some of that hydrogen um, gets used up because um, it's being converted into NH3 along with the nitrogen. And so when we now reach this new equilibrium, notice that we have more NH3, less nitrogen, but we have more hydrogen. Not as much as we squirted in, but more than we started with. And when we look at our Kc value being NH3, and that's squared, and then N2, and I know those should be brackets instead of parentheses, but bear with me. Um, if we could lift these concentrations out and plug them in there, we would find that, in fact, we're back to exactly the same equilibrium. Yeah? The rate, well, so not initially. Initially, the rate of the forward reaction increases because we've added more hydrogen, thereby increasing the rate. But when it finally settles back down at equilibrium, then yes, now the rates are the same as they were before. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Try that again, Max. I, I, I wasn't quite tracking with you. So like if for some reason this thing settled down at an equilibrium and you just had a bunch more nitrogen for some reason? Oh, 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 oh. So you mean there are literally more things that are react? Okay, ask your question again. Um, well, I mean, we would have to talk about specific examples. But imagine that we magically just added another reactant here, which then would add another factor here, right? 
then any change that we make to the equilibrium would proportionally have a smaller impact on the change throughout the system. Um, which kind of makes sense because you realize that there are more things that contribute to the product. So a, a change in one of them would have a, have a smaller impact on the whole. Um, so that's, it's, it's, I'd never thought about it before. It's nothing you'll ever encounter, but I think, yes, what you're saying is correct. But I wouldn't stake my life on it. I'd stake your life on it, but not my life. Yeah. That's a beautiful question. And I think that maybe, Matthew, that was sort of what you were chipping at a little bit there. And the answer is no, that you cannot so completely overwhelm an equilibrium that you basically shut off the reverse reaction. Um, this thing will always be producing some reactant in that example. It, it will always be working backwards as well. With that said, you can overwhelm an equilibrium to the point where, for all intents and purposes, it does shut it off. And that's what Haber did, right? Because this is the process that Haber maximized in order to make a bunch of ammonia, right? So that he could, we needed it as fertilizer. And so functionally, what he did is he, I mean, basically figured out a way to make this reaction quantitative um, so that the reverse reaction was so not favored um, that he basically shut it off. So this thing did go to products. Um, you do that by changing the temperature, changing the pressure. And then frankly, the other thing that you do is you siphon off the products as they're getting produced. Right, Because if you siphon off the products as they're getting produced, basically what it means is that this tube never fills up. Right, If you're sucking it off the bottom, then this reaction is always scrambling to, to set up to, to replace it, um, which is another thing that you can do. Yeah. What else, y'all? Y'all y'all good? Is that okay? All right. So, guys, that's concentration. Great, great questions. So let's fiddle around a little bit with pressure then, shall we? Um, guys, this, this you did not learn last year. Um, this is brand new. Um, but let's talk about it and then we'll play, we'll play with the implications. So guys, in gas phase, in gas phase reactions, pressure can also have an impact on equilibrium. So your choice, if you want to include this in your notes, but fundamentally the deal is this, guys. If you have a gaseous system at equilibrium and you, for example, decrease the volume, which increases pressure, right? Thank you, Boyle's Law. So decreasing the volume increases the pressure. The reaction, and Max, this is where your question comes in, the reaction will shift towards the side with the fewest moles of gas. And vice versa. Which I know is completely confusing and we'll talk about it. Can I show you? So guys, it looks like this. Let's go back to our good friend, the Haber process. And here's the question. If you squeeze this reaction, what direction does the equilibrium shift? That's literally a question you've got to be able to answer. If you squeeze this reaction, which way does the equilibrium shift? Guys, why is the answer shift to the right? There's le and let's talk about it. So guys, don't write this down, but here's the deal. So we've got piv nert. And if we want to talk about the relationship between numbers of moles and volume, what is the relationship? Well, guys, as the number of moles goes up, the volume goes up. And it doesn't matter what kind of gas you're talking about. Remember, that's the magic of ideal gases. The volume of the molecules themselves is insignificant compared to the volume of the... So guys, it doesn't matter what the gas is. It doesn't matter if the gas is a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen. It doesn't matter if the gas is ammonia. 
as the number of moles goes up, it's bigger. As the number of moles goes down, it's smaller. And so guys, the idea then is this. The products are twice as big as the reactants. Do you see why? Their masses are the same. The stoichiometry, the law of conservation of mass, it's all still, it's all still intact. But guys, literally, when you carry out this reaction, the products are half the size of the reactants. Do you see why? So guys, we've got four moles of gas over here, and we've got two moles of gas over there. And literally, two moles is half the size of four moles. So the idea is this. As we squeeze this reaction, it's going to push the reaction to the right because the products are smaller than the reactants. Do you buy the idea? Guys, let that percolate for a minute. If you squeeze this reaction, if you make the volume smaller, if you put it in a smaller container, if you squeeze this reaction, it will move to the right. Are you settled on that? Can you explain why? Go ahead, Emma. Yes. Talk more about that. Why would it increase the collisions? But realize they're all closer together, right? That when we squeeze this, they are all now in the same smaller container. Um, energy. Yeah, but let, let's not go there yet because we don't need to know the answer to that to answer the question. Guys, why does this move to the right when we put it in a small... And it is about collisions, but realize the products are in the same small vessel. Go ahead. And therefore... Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I don't disagree with you, but I still need you to take that to where you're talking about collisions and rate. Because these always have to come back to collisions and rate. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, there is, so let, let's do this. So let's draw ourselves a container and then let's just use colors so let's let blue represent nitrogen and then let's let red represent hydrogen and then let's let disgusting green represent NH3 are we getting any closer to it so guys let's put these in here proportionally so it's one to three to two. So the idea is this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move, whoa, that is not what I wanted to do. I'm going to move this over so that I can draw two circles. Okay, so here we go, and we are in a big container, and let's just proportionally put one, two, three, and then that means we need what, nine hydrogens? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then let's put two green guys. So one and two. So guys, what has to happen for the forward reaction to take place? Who needs to run into each other? Blue and red. In order for the reverse reaction to take place, who needs to run into each other? Green. Now let's take those, and these are at equilibrium. This is the relative relationship at equilibrium. Now let's put them in a smaller container. And so now we've got, how many, wait, blue first? Yeah, it doesn't really matter, but just to keep with it. So one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then two red, two greens. Okay, so guys, here's the question. Who were more likely to run into each other? Well, all of them, right? They're all in a smaller container. And I mean, this is what we were getting at. They're all in a smaller container. So all of them are running into each other more. 
but which one is running into each other more, more? The one that there's more of. So guys, the idea is that when you put them in a smaller container, proportionally, the red-blue collisions are going to be happening more than the green-green collisions because in that smaller container, there's literally more red and green guys or red and blue guys. And because that's the case, proportionally, as you squeeze them down, you're going to get more red-blue collisions than you are green-green collisions. And the red-blue collisions are going to make this reaction speed up more. Does that make sense? Okay, so guys, I know that that's sort of counter to the way we discussed it here. So this is the whole idea. When we make a reaction smaller, it will shift towards the direction that has fewer moles. The reason is because that decrease in volume has a proportionally greater increase in the forward rate where there's more moles. Do you get the idea? So now let's talk about it. Emma, go ahead. Are you sure? Okay. Guys, are you settled with the reasoning behind this and, importantly, how to describe it? The prediction and the description are separate ideas. I look and I say the one with fewest moles is the side it's going to shift. The reason is because the side with more moles will have a proportionally greater increase in rate. And now, Max, to bring this full circle, this is delta N. So when we talk about delta N, it's products minus reactants. And so in this case, delta N would be negative 2. Um, and that's the value that you'd plug into that crazy KCKP equation, which we don't need to do anymore. Yeah? Correct. Shifting it towards the side with fewer moles. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Anything else there, y'all? You guys good? We're okay? Yeah? Are you sure? Come on. What if you and Emma got together? Together, could you guys come up with a question? Okay, that's fair. All right. You guys all done? Oh, please. So. It's not, well, and you have to be especially careful with concentration here because these are gases. These aren't in water. So, it, so concentration is a word I would shy away from, but what we would say is it all comes down to collision model and rate. It decreasing the volume proportionally has a, has a greater increase in the collisions for the forward reaction because there are more of those particles present. Is that okay? Is that okay? Because we are we done with pressure and volume related, related relative? relative? Yeah. All good. All good. Oh, so you let me let me try to repeat this back to you. So if we had this system and we made it smaller, we know the pressure goes up. But if we were to do a similar change to a container that only contained one gas, so it wasn't reacting, um, the, no, the pressure change overall would be the same. That here we have a mixture of gas. Wait. No, you're right because n is changing. Yes. No, you're cr yeah, no, you're right. That the, the n is changing for our mixture of gases which would make Pivner solve differently than just a single gas that's just simply changing volume. 
No, you're absolutely right, because N is changing. Yeah, that's interesting. That sounds like a science fair project. You guys all done with this? We good? All right. So guys, one more to talk about. And the last one we need to talk about is, is um, temperature. So, um, so here's the scoop, guys. I'm going to give you the concept. And actually, I mean, it's interesting. This is going to get back sort of your question about what is it that makes this happen? And I said energy. It really is. And we're going to talk about it right now. Um, so, guys, let's talk about temperature. And let me just let me lay this at your feet. And then let me explain to you how to think about this. So, guys, temperature, strangely enough, um, changes equilibrium differently than pressure or concentration. Um, so when pressure or concentration changes, it shifts the equilibrium without changing Kc or Kp. And Matthew, that's what you were sort of digging at a little bit with our concentration changes about those ratios. And we got to the idea that the ratio ultimately ends up the same. Well, guys, when we change temperature, it shifts the equilibrium, but the 65-35 changes. So when we change equilibrium by changing temperature, guys, what ends up happening is we change the equilibrium mixture. It doesn't go back to the 65-35 ratio. If you're not sure why, guys, you may remember that some time ago we said that Kc is products by, divided by reactants, but then we also said that that is equal to the ratio of K forward divided by K reverse. And back in the previous chapter, we talked about the idea that we can change these little c rate constant values by changing things like temperature and surface area and things like that. So guys, when we change the temperature, we are changing the equilibrium, but we're actually changing this because what we're actually changing are the k values. Does that make sense? What then do you need to be able to do with this? And guys, fundamentally the deal is this. When you're trying to figure this out, just treat heat like a reactant or a product. Um, and as you do that, if a reaction is exothermic, reaction or heat is a, re is a, is a product. And if you've got an endothermic reaction, then, then heat is a reactant. Can I go on or are you, is that, can I show you what we're talking about? So guys, let's do this. Let's go back to um, H2 plus N2 in equilibrium with 2NH3. And where's my other two? Uh, here. Did I do that wrong? Oh, N3 here. And now am I okay? Ah. You guys need a smarter teacher. Now I'm done. Okay. So, no? Ah! Okay. Guys, here, here, here's the other thing you need to know about this reaction. It's endother... Wait, yes, it's endothermic. Guys, this reaction is endothermic. So then the question becomes this. If the reaction is endothermic, which direction will the equilibrium shift if you heat it up? Let me explain to you how to think about this. So guys, if a reaction is endothermic, that means energy is going in. We're in the system, right? So energy is going in. We can think about that as if heat is a reactant. Now, if we are heating something up, heat goes up. And if heat or any other reactant goes up, what's going to happen to the stuff on the same side? They go down, and this goes up, and that shifts the equilibrium to the right. Is that okay? 
So guys, that's the way to deal with endo and exothermic reactions relative to temperature changes, is just simply treat heat as a reactant if it's endothermic, a product if it's exothermic, and then it's the same, same side does the opposite stuff that you learned before. You good there? Okay, one last thing to go and we're done. And guys, it's this. Uh, oh, drawing dots again. Guys, catalysts. Here's the deal. You don't even need to write this down. Guys, catalysts change the rate of a reaction. But they change the forward, and they do that by dropping the activation energy. But guys, this decrease is equivalent for the forward and reverse reactions. So guys, adding a catalyst to a reaction does not change the equilibrium mixture. Instead, you just get to equilibrium faster. Yeah? We're done. That's it. And there's your homework.